in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect the indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people on planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This critical raw materials act, CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals in civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous peoples' organizations are organizing to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect the indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people on planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This critical raw materials act, CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals, and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals in civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous peoples' organizations are organizing to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect the indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people on planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. 
A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This Critical Raw Materials Act CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals, and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals and civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous peoples' organisations are organising to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people and planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This Critical Raw Materials Act CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals, and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals and civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous people's organisations are organising to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people and planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This Critical Raw Materials Act CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals, and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals and civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous peoples' organisations are organising to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, 
provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, including intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people on planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This critical raw materials act, CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals in civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy Good afternoon and a warm welcome from my side uh, to the panel and to the audience. My name is Tobias Kindripa. I'm the global lead for mining and metals for WWF. And I would like to, uh, with the panelists today, have a conversation about strategic partnerships and raw materials. Is it possible to ensure just and sustainable partnerships in the context of a growing critical materials demand? Um, as you can see, we, we put the tables away, so I hope uh, everything is more open and we can have a, have a <laughs> close discussion on that. Um, we will have, in the beginning, a short um, Q&A within the panelists um, and then um, getting into the discussion with each other, as well as in the last 30 minutes having a really open discussion. So please put your questions on Slido, and if you uh, urge to have um, a, a vocal conversation about that, please stand up and let us know, so I will, I will put you on the on the on the floor. Um, so, as you are familiar with, uh, the new Critical Raw Materials Act, which was politically yesterday uh, <laughs> decided, uh, at least in the path of what is um, 
important part is strategic partnerships uh, with different kind of countries. We will have different kind of representation today on that. And so what is the strategic partnerships uh, within the European Union and with the partner countries look like and what's actually something we need to get a hands of with in the next years and decades. So I would like to introduce each panelist and then we'll start with uh, Cécile Bilot. Cécile Bilot, uh, on my left side, is the head of the Unit for Private Sector Trade Investment, Climate and Employment at the DG uh, INTPA for the European Commission. Uh, Cécile has been working for the Commission for more than 15 years and holds various positions in health, uh, climate, development and trade. And before that, she worked for the Cabinet of the Trade Commission of Phil Hogan and was previously um, the head of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific uh, at the Unit DG Trade at the European Commission. So warm welcome from my side and from the audience. Uh, next speaker is Emmanuel uh, Umpulan Kumba. He's the executive director of the African Natural Resource Watch, um, AfriWatch. Uh, he's an expert on business and human rights and on the governance of the extractive sector um, in the DRC and in Africa in general. Um, he was previously executive director of Action Against uh, Impunity for Human Rights, coordinator of the platform of civil society organizations working in the mining sector of Katanga. Warm welcome from my side and from the audience as well, Emmanuel. Uh, on the left side as well is Jenny Rodriguez. Jenny Rodriguez is the senior lawyer ecosystems program at the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense called AIDA. Um, Jenny um, is a senior attorney with AIDA's ecosystem program and coordinator of the Environmental Justice Network in Colombia. She's a lawyer and human rights specialist. She worked at the Colombian Constitutional Court and was a consultant for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. So a warm welcome from my side and from the audience as well, Yanni. Great to have you. On the left as well is uh, Katy uh, Guerraitza, I hope I said that right, sorry, <laughs> um, from the Green Alternative Georgia. Uh, Katy has over 20 years of experience in environmental protections, and since 2008, she worked at the Georgian non-governmental organization, Green Alternative, as a policy analyst and other positions. Katy has been involved uh, in monitoring and assessing, uh, extracting industry performance in Georgia and national mining policies for more than 10 years. So welcome will come from my side and from the audience as well. And last but not least on the left side is Bartiab Ferbeck. He is the researcher at the Center of Research on Multinational Corporations called SOMO. Um, Bart works as a senior researcher in the climate justice team of the Center for Research and Multinational Corporations, which is an independent research organization based in Amsterdam. Bart has experience with research and advocacy on trade and investment policies and the interaction with environmental and human rights, climate action and energy transition. So a warm welcome from my side and the audience as well. So that was the introduction, so you know who's on the stage um, and you can understand a bit where you come from. Um, to, to the uh, at the beginning, I would like to, as we do have different kind of point of views uh, and different kind of angles to really understand what your point of view about strategic partnerships are, where you come from, and what do you think is needed? So I will I will start with uh, Emmanuel um, in in the question of what plans strategic partnerships in between the European Union and partner countries such as Zambia, for example, the DRC. Um, how can they be balanced, and what needs to be the balancing part of it? So I give the microphone over you, to you, and the floor is yours, Emmanuel. Yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, for the question, uh, I will start uh, by saying that, uh, of course, as a civil society, we are following uh, the question of uh, the partnership between uh, the DRC, Zambia, and the EU. Um, and as you know, uh, this is, the I, th I think, the second one, because the DRC have already signed the other one with the US. So we... It, uh, it in the context where uh, you have Chinese companies which are trying are controlling a big uh, piece of all uh, critical materials, um, uh, all strategic materials in in DRC and also in some um, African countries or global south, and uh, so we it normal that uh, EU is trying to to come back and to negotiate with uh, African countries. Uh, the first point is is that what make the difference because we used to have uh, companies coming in Africa 
uh, for instance, Belgium, from Belgium, from France, from everywhere. But this specific is that now we have the EU is coming as a group to negotiate. That's the first point. The, the second one is, uh, and I know why they are coming, is because they need to balance Chinese uh, power in controlling all, all these minerals. The second thing is that um, we have been criticizing Chinese uh, for lack of transparency. And uh, now we, we are in the same process. The contract, the MOU have been signing between EU and uh, DRC and Zambia, but we don't have access to it. We don't know what uh, is in it, but we saw just the press release. And uh, so the question is, is there any difference between what they are, we, we use to criticize and what we are seeing now? Because we don't know when they starting uh, discussing and how they have been signing without uh, participation of communities, of civil society. Uh, so, uh, so it's a question. So we don't know uh, if that will allow us to, to have uh, a really partnership where uh, African country will uh, will get profit because what we are trying to say every day is that, of course, minerals are going to China, and then they can refine them, and we we get less in terms of profit. So EU is coming, and uh, at the beginning, instead of starting with transparency, uh, is we found that there is lack of transparency, so we don't know what will be in terms of change. Thank you so much. Um, and this is uh, then the perfect overlay to Cecile um, to, to ask about those partnerships coming from the Commission. Uh, in terms of, we get into the conversation about transparency um, later on, but first of all, from the Commission side of point of view, what's the idea behind the strategic partnerships, where to go to in the next future, and what are potential obstacles, and then we can talk in the detail about transparency coming uh, within the uh, partnerships with the DRC, for example, but also Zambia and Namibia. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this panel. I think this is very important also uh, to discuss and engage with all of you on, on, uh, on the topic. Um, and just immediately um, uh, coming back to, to what uh, you were asking also about the strategic partnership. Uh, we have at the moment um, uh, signed, but strategic partnership, it's, it's two things at the same time. It's a non-binding agreement. It's a memorandum of understanding, which is very much you get memorandum of understanding done on many different areas. It's a sort of intention, and it's two pages of uh, intention with a partner country to say that we like each other, we want to work with each other. I mean, I'm simplifying, but it's a sort of saying, okay, we both have an interest for our partner country who comes to us saying, we want to develop uh, the added value as a critical raw material value chain. Yes, we want a different offer probably than what uh, China has offered so far. We want to have the added value. We want to be done sustainably. And we say as the EU, yes, this offer we have an interest also in engaging with you because this is the basis of our proposal, so to say. We'll never be as efficient as uh, China to invest in, in Africa, but we can uh, try to do it uh, with certain values. Yeah, we know it is, we are well known for that, but this is what it is, and this is important. We do believe it is part of our DNA. And also uh, with, um, uh, with the value addition uh, in, in, in the CRM material, uh, which is for us from data impact a very important component because what? It means creating jobs and, and helping to develop the economy of our partner country. If you take the raw material raw from the countries, then okay, you create very limited opportunity for jobs and for value addition and for growing up the value chain. So that's very much this dimension that is of interest for our approach and for our partnership. Um, I hear what you're saying about uh, the memorandum of understanding not being available, and I'm surprised. I wanted to check, uh, because for sure, uh, the one with Namibia, I'm sure it is online. Uh, the one with DRC and Zambia should be online. There's nothing hidden about that. Uh, it's two free pages document. It, it would not give you a lot of detail. Uh, probably maybe it hasn't been put yet uh, because of just we're too busy or, or our communication 
registration line, but I will check on that, but you will find them online. Um, what is important as a next step in the strategic partnership is that we um, sort of uh, propose to our partner country five areas of cooperation, uh, which is really trying to take the different angles into it. So not only working on mining, this is not what is there at stake, but it's working on the different aspects around the mining value chain. So the five pillars we propose to work in is, of course, an important one is how to help promote investment and to get business, sustainable business investment in the country. But the second one is equally important is how we can support on ESG standards and, and bringing it up uh, up the standards and helping you with implementation, with, um, with also governance, being member of the ITI, uh, improving transparency and all this. Uh, the third pillar is uh, the skill and training elements because this is also what we see there. Uh, if you want to invest and go up the value chain, you need the right skills and the right uh, people able to do that in Africa. So we want to also combine them with that uh, skills um, uh, activity and program. And then fourth, uh, it's a broader also infrastructure, because what is at stake? Often you see also business who may consider investing in Africa. Now I'm talking more about Africa. It, it depends on each of the country, but they would say, yeah, we can go, I mean, we are a big company and we can invest there, but infrastructure, we don't have energy a sustainable uh, way. Um, we don't have uh, the railway or the road to go there. And all in all, I mean, this is, we cannot invest as much. So there's, a, uh, there's something for us to see and to discuss with our partner country. Okay, maybe if we help you with this infrastructure, this would mean we attract this business uh, in the mining value chain. And then the last pillar, uh, which is very important too, is research and development. Uh, because it's very important for the field of critical raw material uh, to be able to have the latest technology, which often is a technology also which is much more sustainable, much more efficient and so on, to develop uh, the, the extraction and further down the chain to develop it in the best condition also from a sustainable viewpoint. So we know in Europe we are quite strong on R&D uh, and we want to also support and have some partnership uh, with our partner into this area. So then we sit down at the table uh, and we give ourselves six months, while well, in case of Namibia it lasted a bit more for the first one. Uh, let's see if we manage the six months now with the RC and Zambia and go through it and design which action here, what the partner country wants, design each action. And in this process also hear what other wants to have, uh, want to pull in. By the way, we also put um, action on civil society, a multi-stakeholder platform into it. We put that in the Namibian forum, so that engagement to organize civil society platform to discuss about the project on green hydrogen and CRM in Namibia. And that's something we look at also. So things that can be agreed also uh, to be done with our partner country in this context. So that's, we open to also get uh, into the discussion during this, um, this process with you and get your input and your ideas on what we can suggest that activity. Perfect, thank you so much, uh, Cecile. Uh, Katy, next to you, you have also a microphone um, beneath you, so I hope uh, that's gonna work. So um, looking at, um, there was kind of an engagement, or there's more engagement with the years to come uh, from European institutions within Georgia. So just to give some highlights, what that looked like in Georgia and what kind of the experience are within European institutions and also what kind of problems or positive impacts you've been created in the last years and the future to come, uh, where from your side point of view, from the green alternatives, thanks. <coughs> I guess it's working now. Yeah, it's working. Um, 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 uh, you may know that uh, just a week ago, I mean, last week, uh, Georgia received um, positive response from the European Commission on candidate status. And um, so we, we, we really hope that uh, we will receive positive response in December from the European Parliament also on the candidate status. Um, and um, so, uh, and uh, about the institutions, I mean, European institutions in, involved in Georgia, this is uh, usually, these are usually banks, like uh, European European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, 
European investment banks. Uh, they've been heavily involved in energy and infrastructure projects. Uh, but now, as it, seem, it seems that they are getting involved in mining sector as well. Um, EBRD, for instance, um, has helped to develop first ever national mining uh, strategy um, in Georgia, to Georgia. It was approved in 2009, uh, 2019. The uh, the problem with that is that uh, actually um, it, it 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 was uh, uh, it should have been uh, uh, adopted as a policy, a national policy by the parliament. But to avoid kind of deliberations in the parliament, finally it was approved by the government, uh, uh, governmental by the governmental decree as a strategy. And in this way, actually, they avoided uh, public consultations. Actually, from the beginning, EBRD was, uh, um, uh, I mean, promising that. Um, uh, there will be broad public consultations uh, on the draft, uh, different drafts of the of the document, but uh, it never happened actually, uh, and it was approved uh, without any public consultations. And um, uh, now EBRD is helping also to develop uh, new legislation, new mining legislation, because um, the legislation we have now in Georgia it's it's coming from Soviet times actually. It was redeveloped but changed many times because of different interests. I mean, uh, from different uh, investors, I would say, and um, uh, so. It's really bad now. So we need new legislation. We understand that we need new legislation, but again, when when bank and when agency are promising that um, that it will be uh, like uh, developed with public public involvement, uh, and they are not doing so, that, that's really problematic. We know that it's since 2019, it, uh, the new legislation is being developed, and we don't know what is written in there. So over this third year or fourth year. Um, and we know that EBRD is ready to invest in mining sector and attract uh, companies uh, in this sector. So it's very important that, uh, I mean, uh, the, the EBRD itself, I mean, keeps to, to, to the standard they declare. Um, we'll, we know that we, we, we have lower standards, but when you enter to this market, then you have to abide to higher standards. Yeah. Thank you so much, and we will uh, touch base on that later in the discussion, um, also to beneficial uh, systems within the country and what they would look like uh, in, from your point of view. But over to, to Yeni first, um, given the perspective of AIDA in Colombia and kind of an understanding as well as you working, and we're talking about strategic partnerships, but also where those commodities are needed for, right? And we talked also a lot about uh, the energy uh, transformation as well as mobility transformation. So kind of your point of view uh, in the sense of the perspective to energy transition and what uh, a global justice perspective, uh, perspective would look like uh, from AIDA's point of view and from a Colombian angle. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you, Tobias. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, AIDA, the organization works all over Latin America, so I will yeah, like approach this uh, question from that perspective. Um, something we have insisted uh, a lot in the advocacy we have done with the Critical Raw Materials Act is that if the act is questioning or not the big question of what is energy transition and what makes just an energy transition. And in that, we want to insist that without reducing the demand of energy and the demand of critical minerals that the EU, the EU is um, yeah, like having, uh, it is impossible to have a uh, just energy transition. And what we have noticed is that the, the Critical Raw Materials Act don't focus on that as a priority. Uh, and it's, as, as, we, as we conceive the just energy transition is uh, not only like a replacement of the mineral that is demand to use the energy we need to live, right? But but also to transform this the way we relate with the production and consumption uh, processes. So without changing that ma that logic of relating with nature and relating with uh, human beings and production relations, it is impossible to conceive um, a change of the of the system itself. So that's why, uh, and we later might. Uh, um, go deep on that, um, as soon as AIDA identified that um, 
uh, in Latin America, we had like huge reserves of lithium, for instance, and now also natural graphite, which was just included yesterday in the Raw Materials Act as a critical mineral. We have 22% of um, natural graphite and 61% in Latin America of lithium, which is the main source of, for, for, for batteries, uh, for uh, electric cards. Uh, we, we noticed that this, there was going to be environmental destruction and degradation because that's what mining implies. All extraction of, of, of minerals implies social environmental destruction in any territory. So um, at, at, that's something that we, we should be speaking on, no? Like what other, and, and I just saw a question that someone from the audience did, like what, what is happening, what is gonna happen with the rights of nature uh, in this, with this policy of, um, yeah, of, of extraction of critical minerals from the EU? What ecosystems are at, at risk? Which communities are at risk as well? With which local communities? 50% 50, 50 of the reserves of lithium, for instance, in in the world overlaps with, lit with, with indigenous territories. That's something that has already been, been uh, studied. So yeah, that, that's that the, the kind of questions we should be asking before advancing uh, with the regulation of uh, strategic projects and uh, strategic uh, associations with third countries that have like mineral reserves. Um, yeah, I can go deep uh, in that, uh, about that later, but mainly um, if I can just insist in the concept of energy transition, for us it, it, on, it not only means uh, they reduce the processes of, of demand, but also foster um, processes of energy democrat democratization and energy sovereignty for the states that have not have energy so sovereignty so far in the global south. Um, and also to, as I told you, build other kind of relations with nature and identify in our consumption practices what are the impacts behind all the energy we consume. So yeah, that's the message I would, I would like to, to, to leave here and, and then, well, maybe we can discuss later how, for instance, um, the cell, the, uh, and I brought them up and I want to just show it and I just like put it in the audience because it's, it's, it reflects what I'm just saying to you and is the, the sale of uh, cars, electric cars in the world. And you can notice that in the US, Europe and China are the, are the, the places where more cars are sold uh, in the world. But all the externalities for the use of those cars are being in the global south. Uh, and, and you put, and you can just like, yeah, like turn, uh, yeah, like say it, and it just speaks by itself. So um, yeah, that's something just was I, I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie, and we will share that uh, with the audience. Um, just to reflect on that as well as uh, uh, the, the OECD meeting this year, the, the former now uh, uh, mining minister, uh, Ms. Villas, was talking actually at the uh, at the OECD panel about why there is still mining in the Amazon when indigenous communities are being threatened, so right? Uh, and I don't know what's happening now with the new minister, Mr. Camacho, but we will we'll touch base on that because also your legal point of view would be really interesting what they would mean. Uh, and as um, uh, Katie touched base on that, because I think that's something, Cecile, I will uh, get back to you on that. So the question is also we're talking about, and, and, and uh, Yanni was touching base on that, is also obviously the legal point of view in terms of uh, mining code, of uh, the mining code in each country. We've heard in Georgia this is not an accurate anymore. So in terms of new strategic partnerships, uh, what do they look like? What are the criteria? What are the processes? Do you look into um, uh, into really the questions of the mining code, the the, the legislation point of view within the country? Um, so I will before getting into Bart, I really want to uh, like to to have this question because it was raised before, and then I don't forget all the questions which I put here, but we have some time and. Please put the buttons on for the most uh, important ones in your point of view. But first of all, Cecile, if you can touch base on that in terms of the um, structure processes as well as the um, yeah the levels of how do you choose basically a strategic partnership? That'd be great. Thank you. Yes, uh, good question. You mentioned in the beginning that uh, we have reached a political agreement on the CRM Act yesterday. Uh, so these criteria are in the act. I mean, they were in the proposal uh, that we have set criteria for strategic project, uh, which comes with strategic partnership, if you talk about outside of the EU. Uh, and here you had a number of criteria laid down. I'm not sure 
what's the final outcome after the political agreement. Uh, we are not in the lead ourselves to, to, we are not in the room yesterday, but what I heard is is on this this aspect uh, has not dramatically changed. So I think the spirit is still this one and, and uh, they are laid down uh, five criteria there. For strategic project in general, sustainability is one of them. Uh, of course, uh, added value and, and value chain approach. Uh, and of course, uh, also the sort of uh, EU um, dimension into it and, and so on. They are laid on uh, in uh, article, don't remember the number of the article, but in one of the article of the CRM Act proposal. Uh, in addition, for all the projects and the partnership outside of the EU, we have uh, set, and very importantly in the law, that they should be really of mutual interest. Um, and uh, with an emphasis on added value, uh, as I was talking before, in in the supply chain and doing uh, them sustainably. So it is mentioned in there, in, there's an annex also next to it where it, it goes a bit more into detail, but basically this is, let's see what comes out of the political agreement, but I don't suspect this will be changed. So this is very clear. Now, what does it happen in, in the sense of uh, uh, partners? Of course, uh, we look at partner where we are interacted with the resource that they have, where also the EU has an interest to get them in a process form later on. Uh, but if you look at country around in the world, uh, there are many who have different resources on CRM. Uh, so this is also a matter of seeing partners um, uh, approach, uh, transparency to what they do, uh, willingness to engage with us and to, to do better. Okay, probably none of, uh, of the mining country or mining code is, is yet uh, perfect. So there's still progress uh, to be done uh, with our partners, but uh, we, and we said that very early in the partnership, that we're going to discuss this aspect and process in engaging, uh, engage with them in, 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 in improving that aspect. So, for example, I was mentioning ITI before. That's something we put on the table. If they are a member of ITI, very good, but then I'm sure they may need some support in some aspect of getting their reports even more complete or more transparent, more available to civil society, whatever. If, if they are not member, we, we put that on the table and explain them the process, explain how to become a member, provide the technical assistance and the capacity uh, for them to do it. And so this is fully integrated in the approach. And one of the first things we, we put on the table with them, even at the level of the MOU. And uh, I can tell you because we I was negotiating that with them. So with Namibia, we are doing that currently. Uh, so that's how we see things. So we, we want them to engage in such discussion also and to be there as a partner. So that's something, if we see there's willingness to engage with us, that's uh, for us uh, very important also for for yeah for deciding into uh, engaging with the partner all right thank you i think there will be more questions to come uh, on that part uh, from the audience uh, but uh, thank you for that and for that answer i have a couple of questions but now i want to uh, introduce and and give you a kind of statement uh, from your side Bart. so really uh, as you've been uh, sorry for the two microphones but i think uh, we can handle somehow um, we are looking at the kind of relations to trade. That would be something to, to reflect on that, as SOMO is working deeply on that. Um, and But also, really, uh, as we've been, and today there was some publication about uh, about that from the uh, um, Raw Materials Coalition to touch base on what the Raw Material Coalition stands for uh, and SOMO is part of and was also in the beginning uh, deeply involved, since the, de since the beginning deeply involved. So perhaps you can touch base on that, uh, Bart, and over to you. Yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, share the stage uh, with all of you. Um, yeah, SOMO is indeed part of the uh, CSO coalition on, on raw materials, which was actually, I think, uh, only very recently formally uh, launched. And it's a coalition of CSOs in Europe, uh, like around 40 organizations working in the field of raw materials. And actually the idea behind uh, cr the creation of this uh, coalition is to uh, strengthen the participation and the representation of uh, the voices of civil society in Europe in these debates, uh, intensified debates on, on raw materials, um, because we believe this is, this is crucial because of the increased demand for, for raw materials will also put uh, increased pressure on ecosystems worldwide and on local communities and indigenous people uh, all over the world, um, whose concerns and whose voices are often left unheard in these debates. Um, and also we try to push the debate a little bit, so we, we also focus uh, uh, on the unsustainable consumption patterns uh, that are actually currently driving this increase for 
uh, for, for raw materials. Um, and also we, yeah, we, we urge uh, to, uh, to focus on a move towards a system that prioritizes more resource efficiency and, and uh, sufficiency and also to move towards a more circular uh, society. And as a, as a coalition, we, uh, we just uh, launched a position paper right before this event. Uh, I invite you to pick up a copy and, um, and have a look at it. Um, and it follows a bit this vision that we have as a coalition on how to deal with these strategic partnerships. And I will just, I, will, I won't go into much detail here, but we have a couple of, of comments on both in terms of the content of these strategic partnerships agreements, but also in terms of, of the process. And, and one major issue is here that we see that mining is, uh, you know, is, is one of the highest risks, uh, uh, risk sectors for, for, for human rights abuse, for environmental degradation, uh, affecting the rights of uh, indigenous peoples and so on. Uh, as you already mentioned, you know, more than half of the transition minerals are located on the territories of indigenous people. So we, we, we really believe that it's important that these strategic partnership agreements also touch upon these fundamental rights. Um, so they should address also the issue of illegal mining, unsustainable and responsible mining. Uh, make a reference to free prior informed consent. We, uh, we had a discussion about that this morning also. Um, yeah, make reference to mandatory due diligence uh, over harmful environmental, social and human rights impacts. Um, and also make sure that there's alignment with key international uh, human rights uh, and environmental instruments. So that, that's, that's, that's the first issue. The second issue is, and I'm sure we're going to we're going to uh, dive into that more later on, um, is the support for producer countries in their own decarbonization and, and energy transition. Um, so these strategic partnership agreements, they, uh, they, they do mention the issue of local value addition, um, but in our view it's, it's still rather uh, vague and unspecified what it actually means. Um, and also, you know, they, they touch upon skill and capacity development for, for these partner countries. Um, but what about other parts of the value chain? Uh, you know, the, the, the value adding is, is much broader, of course, than that. Um, yeah, these strategic partnerships, they, they do talk about win-win situations and, and supporting local value adding. But we also see that countries are increasingly taking all kinds of measures to restrict exports of, uh, of, of raw materials. Um, so, and this is, this is seen by the EU as a, as a, as a risk, no? Uh, to, to secure its uh, supply for, for raw materials. Um, so it's also a question maybe like how does, it, how does the ambition of, of, of creating local value and stimulating domestic industries relate also to the EU's own goal in the Critical Raw Materials Act of, of, of increasing smelting and refining capacity within Europe. No? So I, there's a threshold of 40% of, um, of, of processing capacity in the EU. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of process, um, actually, uh, yeah, I'm going to echo a little bit of what has in, been said here before. We also see that there is, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, most of the documents, uh, it's, it, yeah, there is a lack of accessibility uh, in our view. Uh, some of these uh, strategic partnerships, they are available online, but it's very difficult to see, actually. There's no, there's no one uh, entry point on, 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 on to have all the, all the documents there. Um, it's very unclear how uh, civil society in both the uh, uh, European Union and in the partner countries have been consulted in this process. Um, the same goes for the, for the roadmaps. Uh, so yeah, we, we think it's, it's also crucial to, to uh, secure the consultation and the participation of civil society organizations in the implementation uh, also of the, the strategic partnerships and, uh, and the roadmaps. And then maybe on a, on a final note, because uh, Cecile also said that, that these strategic partnerships, they're not legally binding. Um, so that also raises the question in, uh, to, to yeah, how, uh, how, how, how are we going to monitor and implement uh, these, uh, the, yeah, the standards and, and regulations that are mentioned in the strategic partnership. So uh, yeah, to make sure that there is a compliance also with international uh, standards and norms. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it here. Thanks, Bart. Uh, you raised a lot of topics we can discuss, I guess, for a long time. Um, and but you raised one point, which I think is really interesting also to, to, to deflect to you, Emmanuel, in terms of giving the global picture, right? And, and it seems to be we're really looking at the European Union all the time when we are in Europe, but actually looking at the US and looking at other stakeholders in China, for example, to look at the global map. And you said actually in your statement in the beginning, 
the opinion was second in the DRC. The first were the US, right? We've seen the biggest delegation uh, last year of the Biden administration ever in Africa, mainly due to uh, minerals and mining, also with the vice president being uh, vocal in Zambia about that. So um, can, you, can you put into perspective the difference between the European Union and the US, how to approach uh, um, you know, partnerships and what kind of level partnerships is, uh, if you can? Uh, and also the second question on that would be the 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 the, dif the difference within Africa, right? So we have difference between Zambia and the DRC as well on the policy point of view. So how to overcome them? Do you think there's a more transboundary work between governments uh, within Africa to uh, speak with one voices, kind of on the same level to the European Union? Do you think that's that's happening, or is it kind of really um, everyone for their own? Uh, that would be something uh, we would be interested in, or I would be interested in, Emmanuel. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think um, uh, at the beginning I said uh, uh, European Union is going as a group. And then you see on the other side, African countries, they are coming alone. So we usually call for African countries to negotiate uh, as a continent, not uh, each country um, alone. Because even when we talk about China, uh, we usually say, why? Um, um, of course, uh, at uh, the uh, African uh, Union level, they could not um, have experts or to have a, a contract model which can be the same for all countries. So if you, you need to negotiate with, for instance, COPA in Congo, then you have the same model. Uh, That's that the question. So I, don't, I, I think there is a model, but uh, the problem is... Uh, each country need to be trying to, to control its own resources. And the, ca the case of Zambia and uh, DRC, I think it's uh, one example, the first one, where two African countries are coming together and try to negotiate. Um, so yes, I think that will come, and I hope that we'll be able to, to push African country to, to come together. And uh, I'm not sure that one country will succeed without um, other countries. So we need to do that. And because we, are, we see that uh, uh, China is a big country, and uh, we have been trying to negotiate for other contracts with China. We usually, uh, um, we usually uh, lose because of they are trying to negotiate with each country. So it's a, we need uh, all countries to come together. And it's a need. And so uh, for, um, if I try to compare w what uh, DRC uh, uh, have, and Zambia also signed with the US, um, I think it's also the MOU, it's very general, and we don't see really the content, what, when they say they need to, to I, I think the, the idea behind uh, it, uh, I, I, in the US, they, they say the, the law where they are trying to say the fact that Chinese, Chinese, China is controlling uh, these materials uh, against the US security. So that's the idea behind. So for, for us, it, our partner, it can be Europe or the US, are coming in Africa to help Africa to, to, to work as partners or they are coming to challenge Chan, uh, Chan, Chinese companies. So that's, uh, it's, uh, we are scared about that because it can be a battle <laughs> between a big uh, giant uh, economy um, in the country where people are fighting first to, to get uh, food. And um, that, that one. Uh, secondly, I think for, for us, we need, of course, uh, European to come back, Americans. And at the beginning, we used to have, of course, uh, European companies. And uh, in 2007, they left. And then they sold their shares to Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. So because as a country, we, we never sh sold our shares to Chinese. Mm -hmm. So today, they are coming back and say, we need to, uh, to help you. So is that a good way and a good faith they are coming really to negotiate with us and to work with us in terms of we can have a win-win uh, a win-win uh, uh, deal or it uh, 
just a way to challenge Chinese. So that will not be profitable for us as a country or as a continent. So that's why we are asking more information on uh, the MOU. We need to make clear what uh, they put in the MOU. It can be for the EU MOU or the US. So we need to make clear uh, that they are coming to help. Uh, what they, when they say they need to add value, what does it mean for, for them? And what does it mean for us? You know? And if you read even the EU um, Regulation Act, you find that they need to refine 40% in the, in the EU. So it's a bit uh, contradictory for what they are saying. At the same time, we need to, to, to add value at the local level. And then they, knew they need to do that in the EU. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, we need to have uh, open conversation, and uh, and we lack uh, that op uh, civil society to be part of that d discussion, not just uh, state. Yes. Thank you so much for that, and there were a lot of strong statements on that. Um, and in, and the last point you touched base on as well, then and, and I will make the segue to Caddy because um, so I mean it's kind of cynical, so I get the point in terms of uh, the forty percent. And the, the, the creation of 40%, uh, especially within the European Union, in terms of having high prices for processing and for energy. Um, just shared that, that the biggest aluminium company in Germany makes more money at the moment with selling electricity than they actually do with, with smelting aluminium because they have long contracts with the government. So those parts in processing are happening, so we need to diverse, right? But also creation and value creation in DRC can be complicated. So this is, I guess, to see what the strategic partnerships are about, uh, about, right? To have really a diverse angle, and then Georgia comes into game and comes into play to have processing being built up, and, and Georgia has uh, a long history of processing for commodities. So my question would be then to Katy, to what's, what's the point of view from uh, not only civil society, but also from uh, policy actors in terms of increasing uh, uh, really the infrastructure which is needed for processing within Georgia, and what's needed, and what might be negative impacts uh, related to that, because there are some, obviously. So please uh, go ahead on that. Um, well, in in theory, uh, there there's, there could be nothing wrong with the uh, value additions, right? I mean, what? But uh, in practice, actually, these value additions come with uh, old technologies. Usually, <laughs> this is this is the case in, in Georgia. Um, uh, old technologies, polluting technologies, I mean, uh, um, low resource efficiency, um, without skills uh, and uh, so we, without skill development. So if um, um, for the future, I mean, for the strategic partnership or strategic project, if uh, value additions are created, then it should come with the new uh, green technologies and uh, technology should come with um, knowledge with skills development with training um, also when uh, value additions are uh, created there are promises made uh, about employment uh, like employment of local communities but what what happens what happens in practice is that locals uh, do not have capacities to 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 to, to, to engage in in such type of projects you know they are not knowledgeable enough uh, and usually mm, uh, people from capital city or from other countries are employed, and this creates, again, conflicting situations. So this should also be taken into account when uh, value additions are discussed. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, and, and I mean, that's a question for later on to see, but how is the investment for those things? What's with the new green technologies being... So we, we need investment in Georgia, for example, for new green uh, technologies in terms of partnerships once it's a steel bit. The EBRD was named in the beginning, but this is only one part of that. Uh, probably needs to be more investment, especially also from private sector, right? So how to engage that. But I will pause on that because I want to also ask <laughs> Yanni, we had this conversation before, and there's one question here in the beginning as well. I think it's, it's down there because there's so many... Uh, thumbs up for a lot of questions. So, but one question was also kind of the, and this is always the issue we as environmental NGOs always have in terms of in pricing ecosystems, right? And 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 the in pricing, so the price for ecosystems, the price for water, the, it versus the trade-offs for mining concessions and 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 so on, so forth, development, value creation. Um, but then having the intact forest in the Amazon is 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 uh, worth having, and we have this conversation, Ecuador. Um, in terms of who's paying for that if you do not have the concession which was in that part an oil uh, concession. So my question for you, Yanni, would be um, what's happening within these trade-offs between 
communities who might be in favor of, uh, of actually some concessions for some commodities and those who are not in favor in terms of the clashes in between that uh, and, and how to kind of getting in the sphere of uh, the, the free prior informed consent issue. So what's needed, how does it work, um, what's kind of the experience from a Colombian point of view uh, when it comes to um, energy transition commodities, if you want so. Thank you, Tobias. <clears throat> well, the position of AIDA, a uh, regional organization, is to defend the protection of ecosystem and indigenous rights. Uh, that's uh, the whole idea of supporting communities in all these processes of the advancement of the extraction of critical minerals. So um, we, we have mainly defend that for instance, now that the strategic partnerships are going to start to be implemented, uh, well, even without the act, there were some uh, signatures already of, of strategic partnerships in Chile and Argentina uh, without the act. So now with the act, I, uh, we, we, were, we are sure they're going to more, they're going to be more, they're going to be um, signed and, and implemented. So yeah, like we, what, what we were proposing is that there, there should be a uh, first of all, negotiations and uh, like the first um, approaches to government should be should include uh, also civil society and local communities and indigenous people to identify which territories are, are, are not at risk with destruction of lithium or other critical minerals in Latin America. Because it, it, has, it has to be a previous step before going into advancing with the strategic projects or partnerships to identify which or which of these zones uh, should be like just get out from the uh, like the, the map of the EU or other countries interested in, in the minerals. So for instance, as you know, uh, the deep sea was included as a no-go zone in the Critical Raw Materials Act. And the reason is because it's a, it's an area uh, or a zone where the, there is no much information about what what are going to be the environmental impacts that might might the might cause the destruction of minerals there. Um, but uh, it's not only the deep sea. Uh, we already know that you, if you extract lithium uh, from the salt flats, for instance, in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, there is a high risk of extinction of some indigenous communities and extinction of species such as the flamingos from the south. Three species of flamingos are at risk already. And we have noticed this in some cases uh, that we are accompanying our and other organizations, local organizations in these three countries have already, uh, yeah, like, tell us about how, in, for instance, uh, the salt flat of Hombre Muerto is the name, in Argentina, in the region of Catamarca, uh, some rivers have, have been dry already, and there has been like high impacts on biodiversity. And also communities that are were used to uh, yeah, like use the freshwater sources, the scarce fresh freshwater sources are, have, uh, are forced to, are, have been forced to, to, to displace. From, the from their territory to start doing other activities they, they, they are not used to do, they have never done. So the impacts are direct and is not precautionary principle here, but it's prevention principle. And that, that's something that the act should also consider. There are territories we are, that we are sure in advance destruction of lithium is gonna impact uh, in, a, in a very strong way. So. Uh, what we, yeah, like we, what we are defending and promoting is that, besides the no-go zones, such as the deep sea, we should have territories that the the EU should just avoid from uh, their policy, mining policy, uh, such as the salt flats in the in the Andean region. Um, yeah, so and, and I can give you like many examples about this, um, but it doesn't only apply to, to Latin America. In, I don't know, Ukraine, Indonesia, there are like biodiversity hotspots in Indonesia, for instance, that might be at risk. In the Amazon, we have already a, a notice in Colombia, for instance, a very complex case of destruction of rare elements from a Canadian company that the state was, was not aware about it. And it's it overlaps with a, a natural reserve and with an indigenous territory. Uh, and it's like a large scale um, 
mine for mine for for earth 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 I forget the name tierra astral red earth <laughs> red earth um, so and it's happening in the Amazon uh, which is like the most the the the, the most biodiverse um, yeah like site in 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 Latin America and it's shared with it shares river basin with eight more countries so. Uh, it, it's, it's no limit, no, it's not, there is no limit. So that's what we're asking for, like um, to establish more limits besides the no-go zones. Mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you so much, Jenny. And, and, and to reflect on that, to go over to, to Bob then, uh, because you touched base in, in the first part as well and now as well in terms of um, raw material rich countries, right? In, in the sense of the map you showcased, or where is the production and where's kind of the benefit, right? So. Looking at uh, at you uh, uh, having with so much a lot of work on that in terms of trade, how do you think a country such as Colombia can kind of climb um, climb up the you know the, the the value chain and and in terms of trade agreements as well, which is also an important part. Um, and um, yeah, perhaps you can reflect on that part. That would be great. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important uh, topic also to take into account when, we're, when we are discussing the strategic partnerships. Um, because in our view, you know, some of the EU ambitions uh, as, as outlined in these strategic partnerships, they seem a bit at odds with what the EU is doing and pursuing actually through its trade policy. Um, because what we see is that the EU is actually actively targeting some of these measures that these resource-rich countries are, are undertaking uh, in an effort to 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 create some be benefits for for the local economy, um, and um, because yeah, we see we see that governments worldwide are actually taking more like assertive control, uh, more state involvement uh, when it comes to the to, to their mineral sectors. Um, yeah, both to increase more benefits, but also to adverse some of the negative uh, impacts. Um, and there is a there is a great OECD report that came out earlier this year on on this, the different types of what what, what it's called exports restrictions. Um, but actually, the report uh, shows that you know governments are taking these measures for for, uh, for yeah for, for different reasons. And and so so for example, to bet, better monitor and um, control export activity, you know, in in the mining sector, uh, and to generate revenues to uh, safeguard domestic supply and to promote further processing facilities in the country and, and also to protect, to protect downstream industry. But you know, these, these types of measures, um, they are, they're increasingly seen and framed as export restrictions. Um, so export taxes, you know, or quota or domestic processing requirements. Um, and uh, we see uh, that the EU is, is actively target, it's u using its trade instruments to actively target these types of uh, measures. Um, so, so there is, you know, there is this case at the WTO that uh, the, the European Union lodged against Indonesia and, and won that case because Indonesia introduced uh, an export ban on, on, on unprocessed uh, nickel. Um, but also, you know, the, the, the European Union is negotiating uh, different trade agreements, bilateral trade agreements with Chile, with, with Australia, um, with Mexico, there is one finished, uh, different countries, with Indonesia also. Um, and actually, in these trade agreements, the EU is trying to even go beyond the WTO rules, no? to not only uh, um, um, yeah, to act actively target these types of expert uh, restrictions. Um, so just to give an example, you know, these, these trade agreements, they, they, as the EU proposes, uh, they prohibit governments to, uh, to do all kinds of export restrictions, but also, for example, to uh, require incoming investments to, to, to use some certain level of domestic content, for example, in their production, or, or, or to transfer technology, or to hire a certain percentage of local staff, uh, or to even do research and development in the country. Um, um, there are also very strong investment protections in these EU trade agreements that uh, allow foreign investors, also in the extractive industry, uh, to sue governments and to claim uh, large compensations for, for measures uh, that are affecting their, their business and their profits. And also a new development is that the EU is including energy and raw material chapters in its trade agreements. And uh, the also, yeah, so, so these would prohibit, for example, dual pricing schemes. I also saw a question uh, coming up uh, there. Uh, so some countries, for example, Chile, they use a dual price scheme uh, for, for, for lithium. 
um, that would allow the selling at a higher price for of raw materials for export than 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 for domestic sales. So that uh, yeah, that could uh, so Chile has this dual price scheme in place to to actually support uh, domestic industries. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 difficult to rhyme these type of actions with uh, the intentions and ambitions that the EU is is saying in its strategic partnership uh, agreements. And I, I think when we when we talk about balanced partnerships and cooperation with with different countries, I think we need to look also at trade policy and 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 to yeah to create more balance and uh, there as well to uh, yeah to achieve these objections the objectives. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a lot to say about Indonesia as well in the Philippines, and there's a different uh, opinion there. Some civil society organizations have been to Indonesia. Uh, I was myself in China, and that if you talk with Indonesian companies, 80% uh, of the concession are in the hands of Chinese companies, which is fair enough, but just the conversation we have in Europe to say we might have a partnership with Indonesia is, is, is a different conversation you might have with Indonesian companies as well with Triple CMC, which is the Chinese Cham Chamber of Commerce which have a different point of view on that when it comes to processing within Indonesia. So an important point on that, thank you for that, in terms of um, trade. Um, Cecile, you, you, the only person here who will have a lot of questions now to, to, to help, I think that was not really surprising. Um, so um, we will start with the first 500 questions to you now, I'm just kidding. But the, 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 you've seen, we all see them. So um, but I start with um, the strategic partnerships, uh, the first question basically, right? The club announced by van der Leyen. Um, and then the anti-corruption part, and obviously the now media uh, roadmap, because you're really familiar with that. If you can touch base on those by Emily, Olaf, and Sophia, I hope uh, this will be answered by you. Thank you. I will try uh, first to clarify what strategic partnership are and what they are not. Strategic partnership is not legally binding again. Uh, it's very different animals than the trade agreement, which are legally binding. What we are trying to do with a strategic partnership is to work on concrete projects. Uh, what they are trying to do, uh, what we are trying to do, but it's not my department, but uh, the EU is trying to do with trade agreement, is putting the legal uh, condition in light of the WTO rules. I mean, this dual pricing uh, is not allowed under WTO rules. Uh, the local content is not allowed under WTO. So what they are there fighting, it's a legal, uh, putting into law some condition on that. Uh, but we are not fighting, as regards local addition, we are not fighting um, doing that practically in the project. This is, this is not what it is about in the EU. So in the EU, the position on local content is we, don't, we are not in favor of local content requirement in legislation because we think at the end of the day what we've seen also is that it is counterproductive because it may uh, discard some uh, investors there because you don't find sometimes if you have too high, for example, 40% of, uh, of local requirement on certain services that do not yet exist, then you cannot put the investment and so on. So it's a bit artificial. So that's the sort of official position why we don't like it in law. That being said, in our trade agreement, I mean, if partner country do not want to, uh, partner country trade country do not want to engage into that, then they wouldn't sign the trade agreement at the end. So nobody is forcing them to, 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 to commit on that. So, but this is the proposal that we do in trade agreement. It's it's exact. Then in the strategic partnership, we're not talking about law either at all there. We are talking about adding value also, which is, I agree, a very big term. And it needs to be looked at project by project. It's very difficult to, to make an academic definition or pages of definition what it is about. But what we want to help our partner country to do is that they will bring jobs at the end there and on the, on the, on the, on the value chain and that they will make go beyond uh, the sort of extraction of the goods and go beyond and create the industry around. So that's looking at each of the project, how we can do that. So for example, if there is a sort of mine there, which is, has been... Um, has been exploited for a while. There are still some waste or tailings out of it that have been unused, and they are thinking, what do we do with these tailings? We say, okay, maybe you, we should just um, um, uh, use the latest technology to, to extract what is left over of the CRM, being copper, uh, all the byproduct of copper, germanium, gallium, and so on, and they want to do that, and then do a, a factory to, to, um, to process that further. And then they will sell that back to, to Europe as already processed uh, first stage, second stage, seeing 
which capacity you have, and it's linked to skills and what you are saying also, then you are stronger also as an African country to do that partner together. And that's why we, like with DRC and Zambia, we would also like to, to support this interaction because maybe a, a huge, very sophisticated processing plant will not be able to be in, in every country, and it's better to have maybe one regional where you could send out of Africa. All these things need to be seen project by project, critical ma material by critical material, but basically this dimension of really using in the project sustainability and then bringing it a project, bringing the processed uh, part of it, that's what we are looking for. For the moment, it's early stage because, as I said, what we have for the moment, uh, except in Namibia, where we have a first roadmap, and uh, allow me also to explain that the roadmap is not set in stone. It's a first tool to work together and to, to have us focus on the different aspects of the pillars, as I explained before. But it is, it is to be added uh, as we go and to be, uh, some of the uh, actions are also very general and we need to really go down more into the detail into that. But it has to have a frame of work uh, with the different parts of the ministry involved in the country and so on. So it's a guide just into one direction, but of course we can build along. Uh, this roadmap, there has been for Namibia a consultative process at the local level. So for the moment, we do that via our delegation. I mean, we, this process of roadmap is very much led. We are involved here in the headquarters, but it's led also by our colleagues in the delegation because they know the country, they know the project, they know the actor at local level, and they have done consultation as much as, as they could. That being said, uh, six when we started with Namibia a year ago, there was much less interest uh, about <laughs> the whole topic. So probably they had done consultation and their interest was not so good. So I expect then they will get more interest in the uh, process now that will go. For what we will do the uh, same uh, local consultation process in Zambia and, Nami uh, and uh, DRC. Uh, but of course, we stand ready also here at our level. Uh, please come, come, come back to us with ideas. You know these five pillars into which we want to, to develop activity. If you have ideas, especially on the all environmental part, circular economy activity, uh, governance, and so on, things that you would want to be done with one country, please. Do, do feed us with these ideas and we can look into how we, we introduce them with our partner countries. So that is very much an open process uh, for that. Um, uh, and again, this is not an official document. It's not signed by any party. It's a, it's a sort of guide to, for us to, to guide us in the work. Um, now, what else did I not cover? Ah, an anti-corruption part in the strategic partnership. I think this is coming back to my first point. We are not talking about a trade agreement. It's two, three pages max. Uh, first page is like a lot of objectives that we want together to work. Second page is the pillar. And then it's we're going to have a working group together. We're going to do a roadmap for six months. That's it. Uh, we're not talking about a trade agreement with, uh, because I was working Digitrade before. We have uh, two thousands of pages, uh, many chapters, many provisions. This is very light. Uh, so no, we don't have a specific per se anti-corruption part into it, but we refer into that of go uh, principle of good governance, uh, ESG, and so on. So this is there referred to, but there's not a huge section on it because there's no huge section on nothing. This comes into the activity. And of, co of course, it's non-binding too. So it's, it's okay, if you may even push for a part like this, what effect would it really have? So we prefer to build on activity concretely, which can have effect. So that's very much the spirit of the strategic partnership. So to explain uh, this kind of animal we are talking about, uh, that I guess uh, answer many of the questions. I don't know if I forgot something. Um, no, I think that that is important also to clarify regarding the the, the position that just uh, the colleague Bart present, and is that despite the fact that this is not binding the strategic partnerships, there is a huge legal framework about the investor state uh, disputes that should be taken into account as well. Uh, so there is a this binding treaties regarding how to solve, for, for instance, dispute that may arise between an investor and a country, and that's binding for the EU states. And, and, and also, these uh, new strategic partnerships uh, that are going to be uh, signed and implemented might demand more um, free trade agreements and more 
bilateral uh, clauses within other treaties from our countries. So that's something that, and, and that, those are going to be binding. That, so that's something that we should be looking at for, because um, something that we have noticed in, in Latin America and in many litigations we, we work in AIDA, we have in AIDA, is that all the cases that we won and we got to stop a mine or to protect an ecosystem from large scale gold mining, for instance, have in the next steps uh, a claim from the company against the International Center for Settlement for Investment Disputes, the CIARI, for, for uh, the name in Spanish. Uh, so end up like forcing the states to adopt, to, to not adopt regulations to protect the environment. And that's something that uh, it's like something that we, we identify in all the cases, like all the, all the projects that had have been stopped because there has been a high risk for the protection of ecosystems end up in these kind of claims. And, and, and the result is that the states have no the autonomy to protect their, their, their nature and their communities. So that's something that we should be looking at for. This is like banding treaties that are going to be applied at the end. And the system of the res resolution for uh, disputes in, in, the, in arbitration give always the reason to communities. There are like many few cases uh, where, where, the, where the cases have been uh, solved in, in fi favoring the, the community that was involved in a social conflict, so uh, social environmental conflict. That, so that's something that, that we should be taking account. There is like other legal frameworks around the strategic partnerships that are, yeah, like we have, we have to take into account as well. Just to, to clarify on that, um, I'm not 100% sure I understand your point, but these strategic partnerships, they are not linked to trade agreement development that much. It's done uh, really uh, with as DG Infa and DG Grow. Of course, we consult others, but we don't discuss trade agreement in this context. So this is quite separate, but I, I see the, the point you're making for a trade agreement, which is something a little bit uh, separate. Just maybe two points to, um, to comment, because this is also very important that uh, the strategic partnerships that we are trying to do in the EU, uh, everybody is, are trying to sign memorandum of understanding on critical raw materials. The US just signed, I think today or yesterday with Indonesia. Um, I mean, but also our member states. So I was looking at it in, at your report to see if you cover that, because, for example, I know Netherlands is very active also now in having a strategic partnership, uh, France, Germany, and so on. So we try to coordinate also, but each of them are going to do this strategic partnership. Um, so this is something also that, okay, this is always like this, right, when there's a topic. And Again, why this topic? Again, why we are so active in, in trying to work with our partner country on CRM and value chain? It's because we don't have enough CRM material for the green transition. So it's, it's, at the end, it's because we want to fulfill our objective in terms of green transition and in terms of doing better. Uh, so it's not to do the mining per se because we think it's a great activity that, uh, that we love uh, to extract things out of the earth. It's not that. It's because we, unfortunately, so far we need it for most of the goods uh, that are um, that are produced to, so that we perform better for our CO2 emissions. Um, so that's a little bit uh, to put also into 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 the picture there. Uh, but again, that uh, that being said, we really would really value to have this discussion going on with you. Uh, if you can come up with some ideas, uh, what we could put on the table now that we are starting our discussion with DRC and Zambia in Africa, we are doing the same in Argentina and Chile talk about others, Kazakhstan, uh, it's ongoing. In any case, Namibia also, because it's ongoing, we have the roadmap, but we can, uh, some, as I said before, uh, any, any kind of uh, uh, input we can have on, on what you think is important there to improve how you can be better involved, what we can support as activity, we're very much um, happy to, to look into that and to see how this can help. This is really focused on action orientation things organizing meeting, consultation process, um, project, investment project. And again, here, investment project, of course, the EU is not a bank itself. We have the EIB and our DFI. And our EIB and DFI are so far have been very reluctant to go into CRM for ESG reasons, which are 
quality and we, this will not change. So they will really respect the ESG standards, very high level of expectation coming from them. So we will be looking at investment pro, uh, project only if they respect this huge ESG um, standard. So here it, it's also a shift uh, of culture that needs to happen with, with the banks. They are interesting to look into that, but they are very demanding in terms of requests. So that's, and it makes sense because we, we it's part of, of, of the solution and, and problem in a way that's why we are slower maybe than others, but it's part of the solution. Okay. I, I have a question. I have two questions actually on that. So the first question, and please go ahead with uh, from the audience, right? So the first question would be, if I, if I go to, uh, if I talk to Indonesian uh, uh, colleagues, if I talk to colleagues within China, if I talk to colleagues within Zambia and so on and so forth, the question would be, what does the European Union has to offer compared to other uh, uh, regions? Why do you go to the European Union and have the strategic partnerships, to be honest, in the first place? So I do, like, that would be really interesting to understand that, because from a point of view from Indonesia, there's no really need. Uh, you can sell those commodities, you can tell, sell tin perfectly at the moment, the biggest smelting part in China, you can s sell it to other countries. So what's, what's the benefit? for having a partnership within the European Union. That would be something I would be interested in. Um, and I forgot the second part, but it will come up in a, in a second. Uh, and no, the second quad, uh, question was from Michael, actually talking about uh, circular economy and secondary you know, uh, commodity projects. So does the investment gets into that as well? Is that a big pillar as well? Because you, we're talking about increase, but we're also talking about a decrease, actually. And I think Diego was touching base on that in the panel before. We want to have a decrease of primary commodities and increase uh, uh, of circular economy and the secondary commodity. So is this part of the partnership? And the first question, again, what does the opinion has to offer? That'd be great. Yes, definitely. Circular economy is very important, and this is priority into this partnership. I explained the tailings example before, which is one of it. But we really put that as part of this sort of value chain and activities there. We put forward it as a... And we are quite good also as the EU um, in terms of uh, our, our industry, our knowledge in this area and so on. So yes, we, we do believe we have a lot to offer on that. What do we have to offer as the EU? Well, we have uh, a lot of instruments as part of our um, uh, development instrument. We have our, of course, technical exchanges, uh, TA as we call it, uh, support capacity building, uh, but we also have our new tools, uh, the risking, guarantee, blending, grants and so on. I talked with EIB and DFI before, so we have some financing elements, financing meals. We have um, TA technical activity. We have a convening power also to put to put actors at the table and to try to foster the discussion, to try to foster positive changes. So that's basically our offer. And uh, working really concretely on some project, building the different... Also, what is maybe, um, if you look versus one specific country in Europe, uh, you would see that also because in Europe we have stopped mining uh, in most of the country in the past 10, 20 years. Uh, so our, our strength in terms of uh, the value chain uh, is not as strong as in other country. I mean, we, we, we are maybe good in uh, Germany in equipment. We are very good in technology, in, for example, in, in Finland. I mean, I don't take it there are other country too. I'm just making a bit of categorizing th there. Um, we have still in France uh, some extractive company, uh, but non-one country has the full um, uh, private sector activity for the whole range of the CRM, and that's when we talk to our EU member states, so we believe you will want to do an impactful project that really uh, takes a different uh, step of the value chain. Uh, if we do it as European, we are eager to pull the different strength from the different country and put them together uh, with a European casket and some fundings. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I remember my last part also was about related to the question you, you touched base on, which is interesting, but I, we want to listen to some other speakers, but the, 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 the kind of conflict between the Commission and the strategic partnerships versus the member states having partnerships on their own, right? So this kind of issue is something I think we need to reflect on as well, as we know that Germany, for example, just had a new treatment and so on. Um, but I want to reflect on what you said the European Union has to offer. So uh, I would like to give the opportunity to Emmanuel and Katie uh, and to Yeni to really think like outside from, from the European Union. Is that something... And I mean, engaging with the European Union soon, hopefully, as a member state, uh, Georgia, is it something the European Union really has been seen as offering? Um, 
Or is that something where you think it's just one another kind of bit? So the, one of the conversation I had, just to give an example, is that the standards are too high to, to apply on that, for example. The investment is too much for green technology, and there's not enough tools and instruments, as you mentioned, for example, which are actually needed in some of the countries. So I just give the floor to Emmanuel, uh, to Katy, and to Yeni, uh, and please put in some other questions. Um, what is your kind of point of view, and does the European has to offer? What do they need to offer more? Thank you very much. Um, also for all the clarifications. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it, that's why we are asking for the debate. And because I think for me, if I, 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 uh, I say, I, I talk as a civil society coming from uh, global staff, I would say that is not enough. Because we have been, all tools, they exist, they are there. But the question we are talking is about how we share, we share profit. How we share profit, that one. And by asking how we share profit, we ask also the question of development. So the good offer for, for me will be if we can talk and say, can we change our economic model? Otherwise, we still we still uh, doing the same thing, and the impact will not be profitable for us as a continent. Uh, I would add, um, uh, from Georgian perspective, this is um, better environmental and social labor standards, um, better enforcement and compliance assurance, uh, and um, increased transparency and decision making and as well as accountability. This would really help. Yeah. Yeah, well, I will I will insist in the importance of um, having like the highest standards of participation according to the international human rights law and that means that the participation of civil society is guaranteed in this in the in all the scenarios where the EU is uh, speaking to the governments in all over the world. Uh, and that means not only to hear the communities and hear the so civil society, but include in the decision making their voices. That's the highest standard. So highest standards of participation and transparency also. We, we have noticed that in, the, in, the, in both of the strategic partnerships that were signed with uh, Chile and Argentina, the communities and the civil society get to know about this just through the media when they when when they they notice that there was a partnership with in the media and in both of them the added value for instance was decided in advance so at the end is, is are the governments deciding which what is the added value that the eu uh, can bring uh, into the into the country or into the communities so that added value should also be defined with with the people that is going to suffer the externalities for destruction. So, um, yeah, like some, that, that is something that we have also um, pushed for. And also, um, this is something that we s insist a lot uh, uh, when doing advocacy with other governments, and is we should be asking for the application of the highest environmental standards uh, in all projects uh, that are being implemented in Latin America. And what that I mean, the standards that are being applied here in Europe, yeah? We should be asking for that. that the, the same standards that they use here in Europe for destruction of gold, copper, coal, etc., should be used in Latin America and in the third countries. And if that happens, the problem is that the price of the mineral is going to increase. But that's something that should be acknowledged, yeah? The price is going to increase. The processes of extraction are going to be more slow, slower. Uh, and that's something that the EU should also acknowledge. Energy transition, respecting human rights and respecting the environment is going to be a slow energy transition. And we need to acknowledge that. So that's something yeah, we would like to insist on. Yeah, that question was not addressed to me, but uh, <laughs> I'll take the opportunity to just briefly respond to what Emmanuel was saying. I think 
Um, and so we are starting to look at uh, the nickel sector in Indonesia uh, a bit, and uh, we see uh, that there are uh, yeah many developments. Uh, there are yeah the the nickel sector industrial policies they they ha in in terms of economic uh, um, developments the yeah the, the policies are producing uh, they so um, <coughs> Indonesia is able to attract more uh, investment in in metal smelting and, and processing and even the Indonesian government is uh, heavily investing or facilitating at least uh, the development of uh, battery uh, uh, facilities uh, and uh, even a, an electric vehicle. Uh, yeah, industry, um, but of course, I mean, I, I just came back from Indonesia and I, I visited a lot of the yeah, some of the the nickel mining sites and the industrial sites, and I mean, the the impact of the policy is is, is huge, uh, both in terms of environmental uh, degradation, but also in terms of, of labor rights, and 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 we spoke to to some uh, local partners and and some workers in the the smelting uh, industry. Uh, and it became quite obvious that I mean, you know, it's it's mainly Chinese companies that are working there, uh, and, um, and 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 everybody was basically agreeing. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't want to offend anybody here, but I mean, the Chinese companies are like the worst in the sector. So there are also some other international companies, but and and the the feeling was that like, you know, European companies and, and maybe North American companies, they, they could offer something in terms of, you know, more, more sustainability standards. I mean, you can think of it what you want, but if you compare it to the companies that are currently operating in that sector, you know, that this is something that, that Europe can offer in that sense. And, you know, our local partner was actually saying, like, yeah, we would love European companies to, to invest here because, you know, they, they, they bring with them also the reputation, you know, they're, they're under more public scrutiny, um, they have a reputation, and, and there are some sustainability standards. Um, so it's also the task of the EU to, yeah, I mean, to also strengthen the accountability and make sure all these companies comply with human rights standards and environmental standards. Uh, and also coming back to Emmanuel's question, I mean, it's also part of like sharing the profits, support local industry processes, and also share technology, you know, knowledge. Uh, and, and this is also something that we need to talk about. And then I'm coming back to the trade agreements. These are, so, these are also issues that are regulated and, and, and restricted in, in trade policy, in, in, in the trade agreement. So I think that's also crucial that we talk about that. And also, Cecile said, you know, the strategic partnerships are, are not trade agreements. No, I, I know, I, I agree. But I think we need to look at them together as a, as a package because, as Jenny was saying, the strategic partnerships, you know, they are laying out ob important objectives and ambitions and, and laying the foundation for future cooperation. But then again, there is this other huge area of trade and investment law that also have an impact on, on the implementation of these uh, objectives in the strategic partnership. So it, it, it is a broader realm of, of, uh, yeah, that we need to look at. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, but we have uh, 10 more minutes. So if there's some, exactly, if there's some questions on, from the audience, um, please uh, raise your hand. I can see uh, Ipleen, and then yeah, you were first, so I give you uh, the microphone. Just a comment on that. I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, as we've been dealing with that in terms of the Chinese companies as well, just to mention, I've seen a lot of bad mining companies out of the US and Canada uh, globally as well. Um, so that this, is, this is an issue uh, which is not only addressed to, to, to Chinese companies, but also in fact in Indonesia, I guess. Um, so the sir on the right side, uh, I will come to you and give you the, oh, you have it, thank you so much. And then uh, Ipleen, uh, the second person. So please go ahead, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's uh, favorable to um, that you noticed me. <laughs> it's an important question, I guess. So, well, I'm coming from Armenia. And I'm very, uh, very well aware about the practice in our country because we are exporting country. We export um, raw materials, including copper, which is uh, in the list of uh, critical raw materials. So uh, we discussed uh, the legislation and policy making issues during these days uh, pretty a lot. Uh, we discussed the um, Critical Raw Materials Act, we discussed the uh, due diligence legislation, discussed the par strategic partnership agreements and so on in, in details. So the main question which comes to my mind now is the issue of implementation. So okay, everything is well written uh, and I fully understand that we are in a at the initial stage that uh, this legislation and these policies are not going to solve 
all the problems in the world. So I, everything is uh, like complete. But still, if we don't um, speak or if we don't discuss about the mechanisms, certain mechanisms of implementation, uh, all the thing is become, don't, things are becoming a kind of a bunch of uh, good wishes and nothing else. So uh, just a couple of practical, uh, practical matters. For instance, uh, Let's uh, let's imagine that okay, uh, all these um, uh, supply chain um, rules, uh, kind of certification scheme, and everything is working very well, and uh, you are you are dealing with the countries where corrupt practices are in place, where um, you know a social and uh, environmental uh, responsibility not in, in a good uh, quality. Well, and there are some. Chinese and other companies which are not working in the in the same uh, legal environment. So, okay, how how the EU is going to make the countries with whom they signed agreements or without signing these agreements, how they gonna uh, pursue, how they gonna um, bring these governments in their frameworks? So I'm. Uh, pretty much speaking about the integration policies, uh, but uh, again, I wanted to hear about the certain steps, uh, certain mechanisms, even in this initial stage, certain mechanisms of implementation, how uh, the EU is going to persuade, uh, like uh, Armenian government, it's the country where I'm coming from, uh, to sell or to, uh, I, I understand about free trade agreements and uh, everything, but still, a uh, government has kind of a sustainable um, influence uh, on everything. So how are you gonna persuade Armenian government to sell the uh, materials, the raw materials to the EU when, uh, let's say, the corrupt practices allow them uh, to sell it to another uh, parties without uh, this high standard of uh, implementation? So where is the mechanism uh, to do this? Okay. Well, we, we don't have a magic uh, bullet. Oh, <laughs> it be, I don't know. Uh, but that's why we are not entering into strategic partnership with every all country. If the country do not want to, to enter into discussion on this issue with us, then we won't have a strategic partnership with them. But at least with the country whom we have signed strategic partnership, they told us uh, we will enter into discussion into this pillar and this level of activities. Whether it's going to change everything and there's no, going to be no corruption practice from day one or ever from day 2000, no. Whether we will have some project where developed where we think the standards are respected and done properly, yes, that's what we want to have in terms of implementation. But we are trying. Uh, as you say, it's very early stage, so let's see where it, where it gets. Maybe we fail miserably. Uh, we hope not, uh, but we are trying to engage and do at least some part of it, engage in doing a bit better uh, together and, and in trying concretely with some project to see if it can work. No more than that, I can say. <laughs> I would love to say yes, and we have this mechanic, but I don't think it's... It's uh, realistic either. It's it's uh, we have uh, we we can enter. We cannot force also our partner country to, to to for national policy. I mean, it's it's but at least when we work with them, and that's the difference because maybe before we have some activity with them and we don't link so much. Or we we if we have CRM activity, we want with them. We want to make sure that they are done under a certain frame and that then we will foster and help them to do that, but under a certain frame. That's the offer from us. Cecile, I have a magic bullet for you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evelyn Roman Escobar. I represent the Securing Indigenous Rights uh, in the Green Economy Coalition, CIRGE. Uh, I, uh, I, I therefore represent indigenous rights uh, in this conversation. Uh, if, uh, indigenous rights were uh, mentioned a couple of times in the discussion. Thank you for that. Um, and I see a strategic partnerships, and I see a strategic projects. I see a strategic minerals, but I don't see a strategic rights holders 
or strategic frameworks to ensure their respect to rights of the strategic right holders. And what I mean by strategic right holders is indigenous peoples. Why? Because 54% of all energy transition minerals are going to be in, uh, in indigenous peoples' territories. And if we add what uh, the, the percentage of minerals that are going to be in peasants' lands, which many of them are indigenous peoples but are not recognized as such, and even if they are not uh, indigenous peoples recognized or they are not indigenous peoples, they represent a very important uh, portion of the, of the communities which are going to be affected, uh, we think they are strategic rights holders and stakeholders and have to come, have to have a an important place in the conversation. Now, what we have seen is that uh, when uh, Ms. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen went, for example, to Latin America to look for strategic partnerships, she met with uh, heads of the states, she met uh, with industry, he, uh, she met uh, with uh, some finance institutions. She didn't meet us, uh, so far we know. Um, and, um, and then the question is, and there it comes to your uh, magic ballot. We have the technology, we, we don't know many things about technology. We have technology, but we have a magic ballot, and that's called free prior and informed consent. And uh, that's recognized by United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it's supported by the ILO Convention uh, 169. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, in, ideal, in an ideal situation, when you go to states, the states should have the uh, obligation uh, of, of protecting all the people, including the indigenous peoples which are in their territory. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And it's not even the case in Europe. When you go to Sweden, and we have here Sami, uh, a Sami representation, uh, they cannot even ensure the respect of uh, the indigenous peoples on their own ground. And it's even worse in many other countries where the rule of law is very weak. So. When you go to talk to stakeholders, uh, to states, and uh, you mm, prepare these strategic partnerships, you are as actually negotiating uh, or preparing uh, agreements on uh, the minerals, on, on the resources that are on indigenous people's territories, and you are deciding on them without them. But if you ensure the free, prior, and informed consent, then then you have the magic ballot because. Wherever you go, and at, at, at every level, you are going to ask for the involvement of the strategic uh, right holders and the strategic stakeholders. And this also can be a blueprint for the non-indigenous local communities that are affected. Uh, so, with all this introduction, sorry for the time, uh, I ask you, what provisions do you see for these strategic uh, partners, rights holders, and stakeholders in the, in the European legislation, uh, particularly in the Critical Raw Materials Act? Thank you. Thank you. I cannot talk about the Critical Raw Materials Act and what happened in Europe. This is well beyond my responsibility. But I can offer to have a meeting with you to discuss that. It, it, let's see how we can implement that in our partnership uh, agreement. Uh, it is uh, the scope of our partnership agreement includes also indigenous act, uh, right? But as I said before, as long as we don't have an action also on it, and um, so let's let's discuss how we can best do it and see how we can uh, try to have something uh, in the next uh, roadmap that we implement. I think Cecile was writing already, uh, Ms. van der Leyen, so I think... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, and also for the outcome on that. Uh, that that's that's great end of the of the session, as well as uh, Emmanuel to follow up on the DRC and uh, Zambian uh, strategic partnership uh, offer, which Cecile put in there. Um, thank you so much. I know there were a couple of uh, other questions, uh, Diego. I know you talked too much today. We have to we have to, we have to, we have to skip that. But thank you so much, uh, uh, everybody. So please give us uh, and not us, but please give the panelists a warm welcome and an applause. Thank you so much. And now it's lobby time, so go and then uh, have a conversation with those. Thank you so much.
the world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This critical raw materials act, CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals, and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals in civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous peoples' organisations are organising to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people on planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our website for more information. The world is transitioning rapidly away from dirty energy. This energy transition will require major new investments in mining. Without safeguards, however, this rush for raw materials will undermine vulnerable communities, human rights, including indigenous people's rights, and our shared environment. A new act proposed by the EU has the potential to clean up the mining industry and support a just energy transition. This critical raw materials act, CRMA, aims to strengthen the EU's capacity to process minerals, and it will diversify imports from non-EU countries where these minerals are extracted. Unfortunately, this act is being fast-tracked without regard for human rights, including indigenous people's rights, or measures to reduce European energy and mineral consumption. Without sustainability standards or more input from frontline communities, from communities and indigenous peoples living atop these minerals in civil society, the CRMA will undermine broad support for the energy transition and greenwash the mining industry. Under the banner of the European Raw Materials Coalition, more than 40 civil society and indigenous people's organisations are organising to express our concerns about this act. The CRMA must ensure that new strategic partnerships are in line with international human rights standards, provide for robust monitoring, transparency and redress mechanisms, include intersectional gender-based risk analysis, ensure civil rights society participation and protect indigenous people's right to free prior and informed consent. If you want to ensure raw materials policies guarantee a just transition for people on planet, join us at the Raw Materials Coalition. Visit our 